In the 15 years it has taken me to write this book, the real food revolution that it began with the advent of a government-approved, USDA-regulated, organic label has rapidly gained momentum. Popular movements promoting local food, food sovereignty, and food justice, along with a host of eco-label schemes such as fair trade, animal welfare, and non-GMO, have exploded throughout the country and the world. However, despite the resounding success of the now $43 billion organic market, organic production still accounts for less than 1% of domestic land and agriculture in 2015 and 2016, even though it's gone up. 26 years after the Organic Foods Production Act, the Organic Law, was enacted, and 15 years after the National Organic Program was established. So I was a principal author of USDA's first proposed rule on National Organic Program regulation and left the staff shortly before the final rule was published. The story of this process, which consumed much of my life for five years, is interwoven here with the story of my movement along my own personal timeline before, during, and after this arduous federal process. It's the story of how the organic revolution became rooted well before the federal government cared to notice, and the personal, political, and practical struggles that have ensued in the heroic effort to move it beyond farmers' markets and into supermarkets. You know, the history of it really starts with the development of chemical agriculture, the use of synthetic uh, nitrogen, particularly for fertilizer, back in uh, post-World War I. And I have some stories about how that came about. Mm -hmm. And the response to that, that some farmers began to realize that um, this wasn't really the best thing, you know? It wasn't good for the soil, and it wasn't good for the health of the animals. And that was kind of the beginning of, in Europe anyway, the organic or biodynamic school at that time, which is still a, a strong current, a strong subset, you might say, of organic. Um, and. So I, I do have a, a lot of information about the, the science and the politics mm. behind the rise of the organic movement, the, the modern organic movement, as I call it, mm -hmm. um, really evolved out of the environmental movement or in, in concert with mm. the organic the environmental movement. As many people realize, Rachel Carson yes, yes. Uh, put that um, into the public mind, and really what she was talking about was a pesticide problem. And so that was really the awareness of the problem of pesticides in the environment was really the beginning of both the, the major push for organic mm. and the environmental movement. I think part of the reason that I felt I had to write this book, and it, it took me 15 years to finally get it written, um, is because it hasn't been a very unified movement, and it, it came together more or less around getting this law passed, and the passing of passage of the law was a miracle in itself. Um, this was in Vermont? No, nah, this was a federal, federal law. law. The federal organic law, the Organic Foods Production Act of 1990. Mm -hmm. um, and there had been a lot of effort uh, up until then to, um, to unify the movement. And there were all of these different organizations all over the country, primarily on the coasts, but some in the middle of the country who were um, who were essentially competing with each other to have the highest standards and the strictest standards and um, 
you know, and they wouldn't accept each other's certifications and all of this kind of stuff. And really held it back. Oh, it was, well, I mean, it held it back in a way and it also helped it evolve. Mm -hmm. But essentially, when um, the organization of a couple of national organizations, one of which is now uh, has become the Organic Trade Association, and that is a is become a, a very major force and lobbying force and uh, marketing force mm -hmm. and yet the grassroots folks okay. still look at them with suspicion mm -hmm. this tension between the grassroots <coughs> excuse me the grassroots farm and and consumer constituency and the what they you know the corporate organic and you know a lot of people think that that the awareness about all of this and the organic movement really started with Michael Pollan and that's not quite the case and and I think Michael Pollan deserves a lot of credit for raising people's awareness about organic and its importance but he also created like this false polarization uh, between industrial organic and the righteous organic and so that that's one of the reasons another one that that I've uh, why I wrote this book I mm. mean you may this it might have been before your time but when I, I was recruited to come to USDA in 1994 to help write the regulations of this organic, new organic program that was foisted on USDA. USDA did not want it, did not support it, and it wasn't funded even to, to do anything about it until the Clinton administration came in. That's really. great! Wow. And so, um, after that, you know, it took me a while. Yeah. But, you know, I had yeah. never, I, I had got been involved with developing some local certification programs, particularly for NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, which has chapters in all of the New England states and New York. So they recruited me to come help them write the rules, and I had helped write, you know, try to bring some of these different groups together. From where you were from in where Vermont. I was. Yeah. Okay. I was working with the organization that, that has become OTA as a founding member of that organization. Seems like mm -hmm. a sense of urgency is upon us. It's a very urgent thing, and truly, and the part truly. of the message that I try to get out there is that organic farming is really one of the most readily available and accessible ways that we have to actually reverse climate change. There is, you know, there are people talking more and more about agriculture's role in creating climate change, and there are different. Uh, uh, estimates that say you know anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the CO2 in the atmosphere is directly related to food system activities yes. the whole chain oh, sure. and agriculture is the biggest part of that mm -hmm. and there is a lot of more emphasis on what they call carbon farming and regenerative agriculture all of which is about building organic matter in the soil as a way to remove it from, remove the carbon in that organic matter from the atmosphere and hold it in a stable form and incidentally make the soil more fertile, oh, more drought resistant, less sure. polluting, and oh. all kinds of things like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a, a myriad of benefits. I mean, and livestock, again, gets a bum rap sometimes mm. for, uh, you know, environmental problems. But yeah. if you put livestock on the land and in the right management style, and you might have heard about this guy, Alan Savory, and there's similar people. He, he, he's got a TED 
X talk that mm. is really good. Um, that essentially the way that you build organic matter and soil carbon fastest is by using livestock mm. on grassland, certainly in, in the right environments. And it, it, it's anti-desertification. It can build soil in places that are drought stricken mm. um, and it isn't it's the opposite of factory farming really but livestock are really essential to to turning this around it, yeah. we can't get rid of them no, altogether not at all. we have to get them out on pasture yeah or you know outdoors anyway change the practices that are being used and implemented yeah. at these factories yeah and uh, and there needs need, in in that case more transparency oh yeah i mean there there are so many implications i mean it's huge mm, it's so once great. you start burrowing into the facts about the food system and the things that are wrong with it um, you kind of can find your way to any number of issues about health and nutrition, about justice, about equality, yeah. about human liberation. I mean, it really is. And, and I mean, that's just the fact that our entire food system, in fact, our entire economic system is built on slavery. Mm. You know, yeah. I mean... And I'd like to actually read some of the epilogue. Yes, please. Which really gets into this. So as I finish telling my story, this is the end of the book. Um, my life has been devoted to healing the earth and simultaneously human bodies, assaulted by toxic pollutants in the 20th century. The same strategy that can remove the toxins from air, water, soil, and food can also help restore the critical metabolic pa balance of CO2 levels in our planetary respiration pathways. This virtuous cycle is known as organic agriculture. So I am rededicating what remains of my own life to promoting the widest and fastest possible adoption of organic methods as they may be adapted to work within the particular human culture and, in, and ecology where they are practiced. This means political, economic, and social revolution, by the way. Um, so I'm going to skip over a couple of things here, but I'm really addressing this to the young farmers and food system activists, many of whom believe that the organic label, it doesn't mean anything, and it's just as bad as conventional, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they really need to get behind this and be unified about it. Mm -hmm. I have long campaigned against the demand for purity in the context of organic food and farming. This is related to my gut reaction to the demand for purity advocated by the openly racist segments of society most especially the Nazis who were the evil boogie persons of my childhood. My feminist and sexual liberation impulses are similarly repulsed by the repression of women in the name of virginal purity and beyond that, its connotations of whiteness and refinement. Which brings us to the connection between food and racism. The story of sugar in a way encapsulates the horrific consequences of the quest for purity in the food system. A similar story could be told about the fate of our major cereal grains, especially corn, wheat, and rice, in which whiteness and purity have been valued to the detriment of health and nutrition, not to mention cotton, the foundation of industrialization of the West built on slave labor that was justified in the minds of its perpetrators by relegating its victims to less than human status. As impurities have been refined out, the social status of foods such as white sugar, white flour, and white rice has been elevated, while at the same time, their life-giving qualities have been diminished. The, addict the addictive qualities of both refined carbohydrates and refined hydrocarbons is not a coincidence. 
that the production, processing, and manufacture of foods and textiles from these now lifelessly pure products is predicated on an exceptionally vicious dehumanization of brown and black people by those of Euro-Caucasian descent is a shameful and sordid chapter of our history that lives on at the very core of our so-called civilization. So the demand for purity is antithetical to the need for health. Purity requires monoculture. Purity rejects our symbiotic relationship with the teeming microbiome that contributes the huge majority of our metabolic well-being, but instead strives for an illusory sense of germ-free safety. But some purity can be good and beautiful. The rare and exquisite product of well-crafted artifice. That's a different aspect that we should not forget any more than we should turn the tables on racists by making them into the enemy any more than we should seek to eliminate CO2, a waste product and pollutant in excessive levels from our atmosphere or our bloodstream. Much of the damage to the true organic vision, as I have tried to elucidate it, has been done by those who earnestly believe that organic food must be pure and that ideological purity must trump political compromise. To overcome this belief, we need compassion for our own inner fascist. At this moment, it is critical to the health of our Gaian respiratory metabolism that we freely share this vision with everyone, even with those whose political views or position of extreme wealth and power we may despise. The hour is late. Do as much as you can, but learn to be patient. Be kind, but be persistent. Mm, wow. That's beautiful, Grace. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Fallon. Yes, I would love to have you on again and again. I'll come. To, I'll come north next time, though. Sure, that'd be great. Come, come in, in the spring, spring yeah. or the summer when you can have some some visuals from outside. Yes, I would love that. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh my goodness, thank you. For those tuning in uh, that are interested, if you are a nonprofit, an organization, an educational institute that's interested in having Grace give a talk and or a presentation, you can email her at organicrevolutionary at gmail.com. And she has a uh, several books on Amazon, The Soul of Soil, uh, Starting with the Soil, Compost, Vermicompost, and Compost Tea. I mean, you have, you've been writing now since uh, uh, your house. <laughs> Twelve. No, um, uh, no. I, 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 when did you uh, uh, publish I, your first book? My first book was The Soul of Soil, yeah. and that was actually uh, a graduate project at the University of Vermont when I was 30 in that. Turned, it's still a classic. I just deposited another royalty check. Yes, <laughs> it's so great to have you in. And uh, well, thank you. So, thanks again, everyone, for tuning into Fallon's Daily Toast and continued caring and and acting with kindness and making really responsible consumer decisions. So thanks again. All right, bye. bye. <laughs>